for Chapter 35 out of your ward in history. This is caring for the child with a chronic condition and the dying child. So a chronic condition. This is any sort of condition that um, physically, cognitively impairs the child. It persists over three months. Um, if there's a recovery process, it's usually pretty slow. Um, the family and the child um, may require adaptive devices. Um, some examples like would be um, like a chronic condition in the brain would be um, cerebral palsy. They could have congenital heart diseases, um, cystic fibrosis, um, muscular dystrophy, renal failure, dermatitis, autism, Down syndrome. So the relationship to technology. Um, oftentimes children with chronic conditions are reliant on a medical device um, for assistance. Um, there was a bill passed in 1994 um, for technology-related assistance for people with disabilities. <clears throat> this helps provide equipment, devices. Um, there's programs that provide skilled nursing care to disabled children. So the impact of a chronic condition. Um, really chronic conditions really impact the family. Um, and the child, but in different ways. Some people have a hard time coping. Um, other people have come to accept it, but it's it's difficult because the threat of the unknown. You know, they don't know what's going to happen to their child. You know, some diseases they may say, well, you know, your child may only live five, six years, and you know, then the child may end up living ten years. You, you know, we just never know. Um, and you know, sometimes these chronic conditions create a dependency, you know, on the parents. They um, usually have a pretty strong bond with the child, and it's really scary when, you know, the child is hospitalized and, you know, there's loss of that, um, you know, bond and closeness. So the impact on the infant with a chronic condition. So there again, um, just that, you know, the infant is, for any infant, you know, they're highly attached to their parents and, um, you know, going into the hospital is scary. You have other people involved in the care. The infant doesn't know them. Um, you know, whatever they're doing might cause pain and, you know, the infant may be really scary. So your nursing interventions, um, make sure that you're using a soft, soothing voice, um, that you're rocking the infant, trying to comfort them. Um, infants like bright colors, so, um, you know, it sits in a brightly colored room or, you know, if you could wear, if the facility allows you to wear bright color scrub tops, um, calm music can be comforting. And make sure that the crib is not in a place that is scary for the infant. So, uh, you know, when they're performing procedures, um, make sure the crib is not in there because we want the crib to be a safe place. Um, but, and really make sure you involve those parents. Um, you know, if the parents say you're giving um, like a, a shot of some kind, you know, if the parents can hold that infant and be able to comfort them, um, you know, things go a lot better. So the toddler. Um, the toddler is going to have a lot of anxiety. And there again, especially with the separation from parents, um, it, it's really scary for them. And we want to reduce that stress. So there again, um, you know, really encourage the parents to be involved if they can stay overnight with the toddler. Um, so your priority interventions, um, 
So you're going to want to explain everything that you're going to do. <clears throat> Talk about it with the toddler. Use distraction. Um, make sure that the they're again that the parents are involved. Try to figure out what the toddler's schedule is at home. You know, like when they go to bed, what time they eat. Do they use, um, you know, like special little spoons with a toy on it when they eat? And try to incorporate those things, um, use of their blanket, if that's comforting. Um, just to make it feel more like home. Um, the preschooler. Um, there again, um, the preschooler, you really want to explain things to them. Um, and really, the preschooler may act out. They may kick, hit, throw things. Um, you may notice that they start having episodes of um, and uresis where they wet the bed. Um, so distraction is great for these children. Um, you could use storytelling, um, you know, offer rewards for them. So, you know, if the child will let that, you know, let you give them a shot, oh, you could pick your sticker or your favorite tattoo. But honesty is the most important. You want to make sure that you, you know, you tell them, you know, hey, this shot may sting a little bit, but you're going to be brave. So the school age child, um, oftentimes when they get to be the school age and they've had a chronic condition, it's, it's pretty common that they've had separation from their peer group. Um, so sometimes it may, you know, this child may not be as talkative, they may not be as outgoing, um, and really by this time they may understand their, the impact of their chronic condition and, you know, it may, I mean, this is, might be really hard for them to deal with. So <clears throat> nursing care, um, Make sure you're really assessing their pain. Um, again, be open and honest. Um, a lot of peds floors will have playrooms, so make sure that you're um, offering playrooms. They'll have, um, you know, like gaming systems like Xbox, PlayStation. Those are pretty popular in the hospital. So make sure you're offering those things. Um, you know, if the child has been able to go to school and does have friends, allow the friends to come in and spend time with the child. Um, socialization is really, really important. So, <clears throat> the adolescent. At this point in time, um, at, well, adolescence for any, um, for any family, is difficult because a lot of times the, the adolescent is figuring out who they are, they have self-esteem issues, um, you know, peer acceptance is really, really important. So find out how they're coping um, and, you know, know that if they do act out, it, it's not, it's not you. Um, just figure out how to help them cope. Um, so your priority, nursing intervention, give them choices. Choices are, um, you know, what time they want to get up, what time they want to go to bed. Um, you know, don't be rushing in there at 7 o'clock at night. Can I help you get ready for bed? Um, you know, if they usually stay up until 10, let them make their choices. Um, and again, really um, encourage friends if they have a good social support network. So impact on the siblings. You know sometimes we forget to think about the family and the siblings and how they're feeling. Um, you know sometimes 
siblings may feel jealous because there again, you know, the, the child with the chronic condition will get all the attention. Um, you know, the parents are constantly, you know, worried, waiting on them. And, you know, that, that other child may be kind of left out, left out in the dust. So, nursing care, you know, acknowledge the sibling, use your therapeutic communication, um, figure out how you can, you can help them, you know, they, um, the sibling might feel angry, um, help them, help them figure out a way to cope. So collabor collaboration, um, they may need a child life specialist. Um, sometimes the child who's living with a chronic condition um, and there may be a caregiver burden um, for the caregiver they may feel um, you know burnt out the financial burden is so great um, but there again there's grants there's programs that you can get social services involved to help point these parents in in the direction where they can get financial help Um, you want to make sure you discuss respite care. Like I said, there's so many programs that offer respite care to, to PEDS. So, emotional responses to chronic condition. Um, for the family, they're stressed out. And there again, knowing that this disease will eventually end in you know, and a poor outcome, um, it can be fatal. So, you know, the family is stressed out, they're anxious, they um, may be in denial, fearful, um, and just really understand that every family reacts differently. So make sure that you have really good communication with the family, um, you know, and promote, um, you know, positivity that, that the family can really, um, you know, give the child a good life, um, make their, make their days fulfilling, um, you know, encourage them to have relationships and, and have friends, um, you know, when the parents are grieving, make sure, make sure you tell them it's not their fault. Parents, you know, a lot of times will blame themselves, um, especially if it's a congenital defect. They might feel like, you know, I mean, it's their fault. Um, make sure that you listen, get social services involved. So make sure that you're establishing a therapeutic relationship. Uh, make sure the family trusts you. Um, the child may have some growth failure, meaning that um, the height and the weight of the child is on a lower percentile on the growth chart. Um, so. Make sure, like, say a child is unable to take in adequate nutrition by mouth, make sure that um, there's an alternative feeding method established. Um, there's a law that's, you know, that everybody is entitled to um, free education that is matched to the developmental and the functional capabilities of the child. 
So make sure that the school knows about any um, cognitive or developmental challenges so that they can, you know, place the child adequately in, in the right classes they're supposed to be in. Um, sometimes um, homeschooling can be an alternative, like if the um, child is severely um, immunosuppressed. Um, cultural issues. Um, make sure that you're assessing for any language barriers. Um, you know, look for the nonverbal cues. Because, you know, we know that with different cultural, um, you know, there's different religious beliefs, spiritual practices, and especially about, um, about death, um, miracles, treatments. Um, make sure you, you find out what the family believes and make sure that you are catering to those beliefs. So the dying child. Um, the perceptions of death change as the age. So for the infant, they don't know what's going on yet. Um, just it, it's important for you to make sure that their needs are met. Um, toddlers are a little more developed, um, and they might be scared because they'll be separated from their parents. So really encourage that parent to be with that child as long as they can. Um, the preschool age, um, you know, they can pick up that something is, is wrong. They might be scared. Um, and make sure that you're answering honestly to the child's questions. Uh, make sure that they know that their condition is not their fault. You know, preschoolers might, um, you know, think that they were bad, and that's why this condition came about. Uh, make sure that um, you never equate sleep with death. Because sometimes these children won't sleep because they're so scared that if they go to sleep, they're going to die. So, you know, make sure that you're not telling the, the child, um, you know, that death is going to sleep forever. Um, otherwise, they're, they're not going to sleep. Um, the school-age child, um, by eight or nine, children, um, you know, understand that death is permanent. So make sure that, again, that you're being open and honest. Um, the adolescent will have difficulty accepting the reality of it. Um, oftentimes at this, at this age, you know, adolescents feel like they're invincible. Um, but really help, help the family and the patient. Um, emotionally through this time. Uh, make sure that the adolescent has had a chance to say goodbye to their friends, to their family. Um, so before the child dies, make sure um, that you've, include, you've included community resources, that um, you've talked to the bereavement team, like um, the pastors or, um, you know, whatever religious type of leader they want involved. Um, make sure that you follow the policies and procedures. So signs and symptoms. Um, a lot of times there'll be loss of bowel bladder function, loss of consciousness. Um, they may have that Shane Stokes respiration. Um, you may hear, um, they call it the death rattle kind of just a noisy respiration or a noisy chest. They may have um, some modeling, um, decreased weak pulse, will have a drop in blood pressure.
So nursing care, um, you know, you want death to be as peaceful and comforting as, as you can possibly make it. Um, make sure that you're giving the family choices about the dying process. Um, you know, if they want to be in there with, with the child, really, um, really promote that. Um, you know, let them, let them fulfill their, you know, their last wishes. Um, I took care of a patient in the hospital one time who their last wish was to see their dog. And, um, so we got the dog in there and the patient went the very next day. But, you know, if, if you can do anything to fulfill those last wishes, make sure you do it. Um, so make sure that you're addressing the physical, emotional, and spiritual aspects. Um, so make sure that you are involved, um, involving hospice. Hospice is an awesome program. Um, you know, they, their focus is on, um, making the quality of life for the dying person, um, the best that they possibly can. They are the people who are, you know, really focusing on comfort, um, you know, how to, how to incorporate those last wishes and, and they not only focus on the patient but they focus on the family um, so some holistic cares again comfort measures so important um, making sure that you're turning the child that um, you know they have their favorite blanket um, you know making sure that you know, you're keeping them clean, you're keeping them dry, keeping their mouth moist, um, that they, that they have their emotional support, their family, their friends, their siblings, um, you know, that if the family wants a pastor or a rabbi or a priest, that you've, that you've done that for them. Um, making sure that you've controlled their pain, um, anxiety. So after the child dies, make sure that you give, give the family, give the family time to spend with that child. If they, um, you know, if they want to hold the child, let them hold the child. Um, if they want to be alone, please give them that time. Um, you know, you don't have to have the funeral home pick up the body right away. Um, it's really important to give the parents and the siblings and the friends time to say goodbye. Um, grieving. Um, the family's going to start going through that grief process. It, it's... Um, a normal emotional response to death. Um, you know, the family, they may ask why. And, you know, really it's important to assure the family that they didn't do anything wrong. You know, that they're going to have some good days, they're going to have some bad days emotionally. But make sure that they understand it's not their fault. Um, there's different different stages of of grief and different grieving theories. Um, Kubler Ross is um, described the five stages of grieving as denial and isolation, and this is you know, where the family is numb, they're in disbelief, um, shock. And this is the way they protect themselves from emotional pain. They may have then followed by anger, where they, um, you know, become angry with, um, you know, their God or have a spiritual crisis. 
um, bargaining. They may um, question, what did I do to make this happen? Um, then depression. Um, this is where, you know, the they're no longer in denial and they know that this can't be bargained away, but they're going to be sad. And, um, and then acceptance is where they come to terms. Um, and then they find the strength and the joy in life. So the Miles and Perry stages of grief. This is another um, theory of grieving. Um, they have phase one where, again, there's numbness and shock. Phase two is intense grief. And phase three is a period of reorganization. Um, Epperson's. Um, first, the family will feel high anxiety. Um, this will be where they're really stressed. Um, then followed by denial, then anger, then remorse, where they feel guilt and sorrow, then grief, and then reconciliation. Um, coping patterns. Um, again, it's going to be different. Um, just make sure that... Um, you know, they're coping in a healthy way. Um, you know, drugs and alcohol are not a healthy way to cope. And um, you want to make sure that there's resources available to the family. So saying goodbye. Um, again, don't, don't rush it. Let the family have time if they want to hold their child. And make sure you call a child by his or her name. Um, tell them you're sorry. Um, that it must be hard for them. Can you call somebody for them? Can you do something for them? Um, do you want, do they want you to sit with them? Because sometimes it's just, it's comforting just to have somebody sit there with you. Uh, make sure that the siblings can say goodbye um, and that they're, they're included in the grieving process. Um, remembrance packages or packets. Um, sometimes pictures can be good. Um, just make sure you ask. Sometimes um, you know, the parents might want to keep a lock of hair, um, and, and just know, um, just know that, that it's okay for you to send a sympathy card. Um, you know, at this point, it's okay for you to give the patient, the patient's family a hug and, and be supportive, and it's okay for you to cry. Um, you know, just make sure that you're you know, keeping it under control, but it's okay to grieve with them. Um, if the, depending on the type of illness, um, organ tissue donation can be a discussion. Make sure that, um, you know, you've talked with the family about this and make sure you're approaching them at appropriate time. You know, right after the child dies is not an appropriate time to ask about organ tissue donation. Um, funerals, um, it's okay for you to go to the funeral, um, again, it might be difficult and emotional, but a lot of times that family, they really like seeing the nurse at the funeral, um, you know, it just, it shows that you care, um, if you can't attend the funeral, sending a card is appropriate. Caring for the caregiver. Um, there again, the parents or the caregiver, it's it's emotionally draining. It's this is a hard time for them. Um, 
watch for stages of burnout, um, compassion fatigue syndrome, where they feel helpless and confused. Make sure that they can talk about their grief. And make sure that, um, you know, you are taking care of yourself emotionally. Um, you know, preventing nursing burnout. Um, so, you know, the child that has died, you know, you can mentor with other, um, other nurses or um, hospice nurses. If you're not a hospice nurse and you experience, um, you know, a death with a child, make sure you reach out to those hospice nurses. They're going to help teach you how to grieve and what's appropriate. Um, make sure that you are participating in support groups. Um, you know, mental health professionals, again, are some good resources for you to reach out to. And, you know, that you're participating in team care um, for the decisions of the plan of care for the dying child.